original audience would have thought about whatever it is that you're reading in the Bible. Okay? So you're looking at the historical context. Also, you're looking at the literary context. So whatever passage you may be looking at, you've got to look at the broader context. Where does it fit within the literary structure of where, where it is you're reading? Okay? So that's, oh, that's the first and very important question. If you don't do that, whatever other things you do, whatever other conclusions you come to, you most likely will get a little bit wrong. So that's the first question. And then the second question is, what does it say? What does this say to, to me today? Yeah? Uh, th those are the two basic questions that you should do as you are reading and interpreting the Bible. In other words, how do you read the Bible? That's the basic question. So let's just explore that a minute. How do you read the Bible? When you, when you pick up your Bible to read it, how do you read it? Some people read it like it's just a book of ancient history. Critical theologians do that. Um, they, 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 they say the Bible isn't something it's inspired. It's just something from a long period ago that they're just describing what the, the mindset of people was a couple of thousand years ago. Yeah, most of us don't do that. Uh, generally. We, 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 we believe at least that the Bible is inspired. So that's not the way we approach the Bible generally. Some will approach it from a literary point of view, literary studies. Many of you, I don't know if, if any of you are doing any literary studies. Um, generally, in literary studies, very simplistically, the reader is in the focus. So you, you don't think about background or anything like that. It's what do I get out of this? What does it mean for me? How, how am I reading this poem? doesn't matter what Shakespeare meant about it, it's how do I experience this? That's the literary studies approach. Maybe sometimes the way in which we approach the Bible, we're doing that. Because we're not thinking about context, we're not thinking about anything else, we're just, what's this saying to me? Uh, yeah, and we, we, we tend to do that. Uh, and literary studies kind of encourages us. Many of us will have learned to read the Bible doctrinally. I don't know if you grew up in the church or if you became a member later on, but we teach you doctrines. We have 28 at the moment. So if you're going to have baptismal studies, you will be um, taught the 28 fundamentals of the Adventist church. So, for example, if I was to ask you, what is the book of Malachi about? Tithing, exactly. Because that's the book where you find the text about tithing. Because we've learned to read the Bible doctrinally. So we know where to go to find this doctrine, or where to go to find that doctrine. But we don't know anything else about the book of Malachi, generally. <laughs> There's a whole lot more than tithing in the book of but no, because we've been taught to read it doctrinally. That's how we approach the Bible. Another way, devotionally, um, that is then that we, we are trying to find out what is it that God might be trying to say to me. And generally, when we're reading the Bible devotionally, what we're doing is, well, we tend to stay in the New Testament, because it's easier to get something uh, positive from the New Testament, which tends to feel, right? I mean, the Old Testament is so full of some gruesome details, we don't really want to go there. So if you're going to read the Bible devotionally, we tend to stay in the New Testament slightly. Um, and this is the way in which we generally read the Bible. Whenever we pick it up, uh, if we're doing our Sabbath school lesson, we are doing generally doctrinal uh, ways of looking at it. Um, or you may have devotional books that you may read that have a text at the, at the top of it and then some commentary on it. That, that's the way we tend to do the Bible. But I would like to suggest that for Adventists, we need to start reading the Bible as a story. 
This is our unique contribution to the Christian world. Adventists should be reading the Bible at the school. Um, so let me give you a little bit of work. Now, this is the people close by you, okay? The Bible starts with creation, and it ends with recreation. What comes in the middle? So I'm going to give you two minutes, quickly, talk to the people close to you. What would you put in between there? Write, write it down. And For our online viewers, uh, we just tried 30 to seconds to left. How the sound is. Can you guys hear it better now? Okay, time's up. Let's hear. So, in the story, the storyline of the Bible. We start with creation. What's the next major event? The fall. Very good. So, sin and the fall comes in next. All right, what's the next major event in the Bible? Cain and Abel. Okay, anybody else? Repopulation. Okay. Anything else? The covenant through Abraham. All right. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think the flood is the next major thing. Yes. Something huge happens. I mean, everything changes after that, right? So, so the flood. So, what would be the next major event then after, after the flood? Babylon, the, 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 oh, the Tower of Babel, okay. The creation of Israel, all right, all right. Anything else? The covenant, Abraham, most people are saying Abraham and the covenant, okay. Um, I put the patriarchs down because Abraham is the first one, Isaac and Jacob, yes, they're the foundation, if you like, of the when we talk about the, ta the starting up of Israel. The patriarchs, something special happens there with the patriarchs, especially covenant with Abraham and how God's going to be leading from that time onwards. Yeah? After the patriarchs, what's the next major block? 
Egypt. The Exodus, yeah? All right? Yeah? Uh, that's what I think as well. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can have it any way you like. Uh, this is how I am. After the Exodus, what's the next major thing that happened? The Ten Commandments. Judges. Settling in the new land. Yeah, I think the conquest. Joshua, the book of Josh Joshua, really significant. You, you've had Moses, but that conquest bit there, and this is this part here, we uh, have a hard time with. There's a lot of killing going on. Yeah. And we've got to deal with that if we really are going to have anything to say. <laughs> to the world so but yet it's a major part in the bible after the conquest what's next the kings huh babylon okay right you've got the judges the period of the judges is something quite significant be because uh, this is the, the way in which Israel was meant to be led. And as you know, in the book, it doesn't work. <laughs> uh, it just goes from bad to worse. And the worst story in the Bible is in the book of Judges, right? The Levite and his concubine, and it doesn't get any worse than that. So after the Judges, yes, you said it's the monarchy, the kings, and the prophets. The bulk of the Old Testament is that next bit, lasts for several hundred years. What's after that? After the kings, after the, the monarchy? Babylon, as somebody said, yes. The exile is, I mean, in the Israelite psyche, this was such a blow. When you first were a nation and you had all your kings and everything, and the prophets keep saying, you know, it's going to, God's going to put you in exile if you don't, and it actually happened. So it should really say the exile and return, because then you have uh, the books of um, Ezra and Nehemiah that talk about when they return. Some of them return back to the promised land. After this then, what happens? The Messiah. Yeah, Jesus comes. Yeah? After Jesus... The church. After the church, the second coming. Yeah. And then we have some other things that we put in there, but I'm not putting it in here now. Okay. That that for me is the basic storyline of the Bible. So basically, when you're reading the Bible, the first question you want to be asking is where in the storyline are we? Yeah. If you're going to do that historical thing, wh where are we? If I'm taking a text. Where are we in the storyline? And then you've got to understand what's the major things happening right there. Yeah. So when you do this then, <coughs> and this is why I say in Genesis 1 to 3, something interesting happens. God creates Genesis 1 and 2. Chapter 3, we, so if you're thinking of a story, the, the hero of the story is introduced in the first uh, sentence. In the beginning, God. He's the hero. Genesis 1 and 2. And then in chapter 3, you have the antagonist, uh, the villain of the stories introduced, a talking serpent. And what's interesting is, when you hear about that talking serpent in Genesis 3, you read through the rest of the Bible, and you don't see him. He disappears completely. And it's not until you get on to the last book of the Bible right in the center of the book, the, 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 the pinnacle of the book of Revelation, chapters 12 to 14, the talking serpent reappears. In other words, Adventists are supposed to know, what if we take, uh, um, of course, what you're told in Revelation 12 and to 14 is this talking serpent started a war, started a war in heaven. So if you take that information with you and you reread the Bible, 
So you always have that war in mind, in, your back, in the back of your mind. It's transformed the way you see the whole of the Bible. Everything becomes different. Um, and I will guarantee you that. Because that, that's what I've discovered. And that's what Adventists are supposed to bring to the world. We are re-readers of the Bible. Not just a plain reader. Not just reading what's there and just re reading it devotionally, which is fine. We are re-readers. Help people to see the storyline and what's going on. Because there's this war playing out in the background all the time. So, we're re-readers. All right. That means then those two basic questions that I was talking about. What did it mean? Yes, we ask that. We do ask, what does it say to us? But there's, there's a second question which is really significant. What does it say about death? Because this war is all about an enemy saying, you cannot trust God. And so throughout the whole of the Bible, God's trying to show that he is trustworthy. And he's trying to answer the accusations of that enemy. Take that with you as you read the Bible, and suddenly you start to see things that you've never seen before. So let's just take this with us then. <coughs> Second part of this, negative pictures of disability. Is the Bible negative towards disability? Many disability theologians say, yes, it is. Here's why. And here's some of the texts. Leviticus 21, Luke 5, John 5, and John 9. We're going to go into these in just a little bit more. So Luke, uh, I mean, Leviticus 21. You have a description here where God is saying, the people that cannot be priests or working in the temple. Notice what it says. None of your descendants who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. My son, in a wheelchair, couldn't. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame or disfigured. You see that? That's why people say, well, the Bible's negative towards this. But even, even God's saying you can't be priests. Luke 5, because often uh, another reason why theologians will say that the Bible is negative is because it, it kind of associates disability with sin. The story in Luke 5 where uh, you've got that paralyzed man that comes through the roof. Remember that one? His friends bring him along and they uh, couldn't get in, so they lower him through the roof. Do you remember what Jesus says to him? When he saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So theologians say, see, Jesus is associating disability with sin. Negative. Uh, not the only time he does it. John chapter 5. Remember that man who'd been there for four, well, 38 years uh, by, by this pool, and whenever it would move, people would try to jump in, and he could never do it. Later, after Jesus had healed him, later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see, you're well again. Stop sinning. Or something worse may happen to you. Again, equating disability with sinning. And you know the story in John 5, uh, the man who was born blind. And uh, his disciples are asking, so who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? So, here's some work for you to do. <clears throat> I'm going to divide you. Oh boy, this is not right. I wanted to divide you into four. Uh, okay. All right. Um, I will do that. So, let's say the priestly prohibitions, the first half of the room here. Okay? Read that and then ask those three questions. See how you would answer those three questions based on that. You can do it in your smaller groups, but you're working on that text, okay? Um, at the back there, so from this young man here in the black, 
backwards, and you can be in smaller groups, you work with Luke 5, the paralyzed man through the room, through the roof, and you're asking these three questions. The front group here, you work on John 5, the man at the pool of Bethesda, again, asking the three questions. And at the back, you're working on uh, John 9, the man who was born blind, okay? Just answer the three questions. So I'm going to give you uh, five minutes to answer those three questions, and then we'll feed back together, okay? Go ahead. You could be in smaller groups, but just be answering the questions about the first, the first story, yeah? Very good. How are you? Nice to see you. You all right? Uh, I'm just checking you for my body.
seconds left. Okay, five minutes is up. <laughs> I'll give you one more minute then. <laughs> Some people need it. Okay, I think we need to uh, come back together again. Maybe you'll be able to uh, continue, your discuss continue your discussions at lunchtime <laughs> if it stimulated a lot of thoughts. Um, all right, let's have a look at these stories and uh, share a little bit. So the first half of the room here, you were looking at the priestly prohibitions. Um, so what's, what did it mean in its historical context? Any thoughts? Well, we here uh, came to the conclusion that those people that, are, uh, that have uh, disabilities, uh, they're, not, that, they're not sinful because of those disabilities. Those disabilities represent the sin in itself, in a spiritual uh, world. Not, not that you are sinful because you're blind, but that blind, blindness represents our spiritual blindness. And okay. if the priest uh, should have represented Jesus and his uh, perfection, then it doesn't work that you uh, represent with that, not because you are uh, cast out from God, but it was just about the picture. Okay, all right. Thank you. Uh, good struggling with that. Anybody else from this group? Yeah? Um, you shout. Um, Gigi thought more about what is said about God directly, and he noticed that uh, many of the disabilities that were described were oddly specific. So it said if you had problems with your food or mm -hmm. your hands or your eyes, then you shouldn't do the work and the whole um, sacrifice thing or whatever. I, I'm not that good at English anyway. Um, and we came to the conclusion that it is because people with, with disabilities have more problems to perform those hard and long ceremonies that were required back then. And um, I mean, God chose one big group of people, the Levi Levitic, mm -hmm. uh, just to do that one job. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So I imagine that for someone who couldn't walk or had problems with their hand, it would have been very, very hard and physically exhausting to do those jobs. So I think that God just wanted to um, kind of give them rest. or He was them. sparing them from, from that kind of... Okay, all right. Um, so... If we take the last question then, because we've done the first one, 
what would that mean for, for us today? Enthusiastic people in our midst, in our congregations, who are just as talented as someone who may not have a disability. So that falls that we were. Um, I, I put it to everyone. You know, how how do we apply it to today's uh, time? Yeah. And for me, I think taking the point what our sister said there, and you said there, it's very important that again, yes, we consider the practicality of it, but where we can allow space for them to operate, we should. It's okay. Just me. Just not do talk, but just me. All right. Yeah. All right. Yes. Um, yeah, I think, or oh, just to add a little bit on the, I think I'll tie all the three together. I think historically, this is just what I think. There tended to be like really negative sentiments towards people with disabilities. Uh -huh. So maybe in this way, God was, or what it says about God is that He sort of meets people where they are at. Um, in contemporary times, I honestly think what He said is true. There are many people with disabilities that are just as capable as an able-bodied person of performing. Mm -hmm. I think the boundaries or the barriers tend to be put there because of able-bodied people who do not accommodate right. yes. people with disabilities. Yes, yes, and that's generally what, what tends to happen. Uh, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm trying to get through. Okay, go ahead. And, and uh, one of the things that she also learned is our God is a God of love. He loves us. And we should also be content with some of the gifts that he has given us, some spiritual gifts, some talents, and also be thankful for whatever he has given to us. If someone is able to perform some duties that we are not able also to do, we should pray for them and be happy for them. There's also some other things that we're able to perform. We should do it also wholeheartedly. As okay. Well as we All right. Good. Thank you. Um, <coughs> Last comment here then, and then I'm going to go to the next group. Uh, I think that uh, everything about the Leviticus passage, verse 23, the very last sentence summarizes it very well. For I, the Lord, do sanctify them. Everyone, the Lord sanctifies everyone. The Levites, the crippled, the ill, everyone is sanctified. And it's God that does it. Okay. All right. Thank you very much uh, for, for wrestling with that. The next group then, the paralyzed man through the, gr through the roof. What was the historical context? Yeah? Pharisees believe that if a man is disabled, he must be, uh, he, ha he has to have some sin. Right. And it wasn't just the Pharisees either. Historically, that's why everybody believed because you'll see it in, the, in John 9 as well. So, so that, that's the context, yes. You got a disability, you have sinned. Or maybe your parents did or somebody. Else. So, so, so that, that's the mindset that this is functioning in. Okay, what's the story say about God? Second question. Anybody? Yeah? God, uh, he can do everything for us the, the, when we are like, we believe for him, you know, so he can like heal us and everything. So, so God can heal if, yeah, we yeah. if we believe in him. Yeah. yeah, okay. Maybe not just healing, it's the changing for life. It's a turning point. Okay, so he can change our lives completely. Turn, okay, good. Next, yeah. Um, I, I believe that God I uh, didn't want just to show that uh, he's seen now, uh, forgiven, or he's, he, now he's, has, he's fully healthy. But I think God wanted to, to, uh, to show that, um, sorry, I lost my, my thoughts. Uh, give me a second. Um, uh, gosh, I lost that now. Um, the one about the... Uh, I'm sorry, just... Uh, okay, just come, come back else. to us, I'm come back to us, okay. Now, yeah. uh, one more hand at the back there, Mike. Yeah. Um, I think with what he said with, man, your sins are forgiven. He nullified what the precept was, that he was a sinner, therefore he was paralyzed. So he was acknowledging the fact that he was a sinner? No, he said, I mean, 
Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes um, Jesus uh, had to say things for the people to understand, because even though physically he healed him, many people continue to believe that he's a sinner, but now it's just a sinner that can walk. So maybe they uh, could still uh, have him isolated uh, from the community. Mm -hmm. So um, Jesus had to declare that uh, he is not a sinner because in people's eyes he was a sinner. Right. So sometimes uh, Jesus had to say things for the people to understand because uh, it was so disability and sin so strongly connected in yes. their minds. Yes. So he couldn't just say, oh, disability is not a sinner. Maybe it wasn't the right time. Mm. Okay, okay. Let's take the last question then. What does it mean? I mean, you know, what's it say to us today? What's the application? Yes. Okay. Um, maybe it's, it's better for this question, my answer. I just uh, want to say that um, what, um, why do I need uh, to be healthy if I am losing my eternity? So, I mean, uh, I think God wanted to show us uh, from this context that um, all that truly matters is to be forgiven, that, that, uh, that our sins are forgiven instead of being healthy and walking and stuff. I'm saying it's very good to be healthy, of course. Sure. And uh, please keep your health healthy. <laughs> but, um, but I think I'd, I'd prefer not being healthy, but have an eternal life. Okay, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, all right, let's go to the third story. The man at the pool of Bethesda. Is that this group? Historical context, I guess, is the same thing. It's that whole thing of sin and disability, all right? But what's it say about God? Yeah? I think we were talking a lot about God's compassionate nature. Um, you know, the man was by the pool, um, had no one to help him into the water, and, you know, Jesus comes along and helps him, just like that, you know. Um, and this is a guy who's an outcast. He has no one to help him. And that might be because they, you know, saw, thought there was a huge correlation between sin and the disability. So maybe lots of people blamed him and thought, well, he doesn't need help then. Mm. Um, it's his fault. Whereas Jesus, he looks further, is what we said, you know. Um, Jesus has so much compassion for us. You know, all, you know, Jesus asked if he wanted to be healed and he said yes. And that's all he's asking us um, all the time. And, you know, that's what we, you know, saw that Jesus really looks deeper mm. um, and at, at the heart yeah. at things we can't see. Very good. The grace of God. Yes? Um, <coughs> and as well that uh, even if it seems to be impossible for us, to, uh, or me, I mean for the man, he was laying there for 38 years, it seemed to be impossible for him to get into the water, to get healed, what he believed, yes. um, what he needs to do. But even if we think it's impossible for God or for Jesus, it's not impossible. Mm, mm, okay. And so the, for us today, that's kind of a little bit what you were saying there. Uh, might be, seem impossible, but nothing's impossible for God. Anything else? Also, God uses a holistic approach. So he's, he's been preoccupied with the physical needs of the person, but also the spiritual side of it. So okay. it's, uh, he looks at both the physical side and the spiritual And the side. spiritual Okay, thank you very much. And the last group, um, the man born blind. As I think the historical context is exactly the same. I mean, they would even go so far back as to say maybe it was his parents because he's born with this thing. His parents had done something wrong. Um, so what's it say about God? I mean, there was an interesting um, sentence at the last where Jesus approached the uh, Pharisees and he's uh, told them that if you would have been blind, um, you wouldn't have sinned. <laughs> and but you say that you are see, uh, you see, so you your sins are your own. Mm. So that's an interesting sentence where he closed the yeah this um, story with. Okay, and what you said, what 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 um, what does it say so about we, God? We talked about it just a little a couple of minutes <laughs> before the end, and it was like, um, 
it is not on, uh, yeah it's not connected to sin directly the disability uh -huh. so um yeah because um yeah it's it it doesn't fit with the <laughs> disability yeah. right it doesn't have to mean anything with it yes oh. this no another one Thanks. yeah that sometimes instead of just looking for pity with the uh, pain we suffer, looking for a, a plan that God has on us, that it was what uh, it says in the text, that is not that their parents sin, but that God has a, a tool in which he can show his power, and it's just uh, with us we can uh, see this in our daily lives, just look for a a way to try to find a, a path in which we can show what God does in everybody's life. Okay, and that, that's the contemporary application. There was another hand just behind you. Yes. yes. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment on um, the Pharisees because they were always trying to uh, like accuse Jesus of something. So they were like, how can this guy heal people on the Sabbath or do whatever. He's just a sinner. But the thing is, Jesus sometimes uh, prioritizes serving rather than just following the rules. Like following the law of God is really good. But sometimes we have to think about our neighbors as well. And uh, that's a really interesting point that uh, yes. Jesus pointed out here. So if, you, if you're thinking about rules or people, Jesus seemed to lift up people more than the, at least the man-made rules that were there. Yeah. Final comment? Uh, yeah, so I think the story is actually a great example for uh, why God is not disability negative, but the uh, society around this certain context, like even the disciples were kind of, because yes. it was like the historic context, yes. But in essence, what he says right after is no, they haven't sinned and he's still uh, disabled, so there is no connection. Yes. It's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward, I think. Yes. yes. Thank you. Let me quickly, in the last 10 minutes, run through s a few thoughts, just so you have these with you. Um, here's a theologian uh, <coughs> who talks about, uh, he says, there's a fear in every human being that needs to be dealt with if it's not to become a burden to us. Buried deep within us is the idea that when we are going through difficult times, we have, in fact, displeased God. And if you want to test that theory, when stuff goes wrong in your life, how quickly does the question come, did I do something to anger God? We all do it. This is the problem. We think we've done something wrong to God, so now he's going to punish us with something or other. We generally have a default negative picture of God. Anyway, um, so when it comes to sin, something I want you to remember. Sin is about relationship damage. It's not stuff you do. Sin is distrust. That's what it is. It's distrusting God. Once you distrust, because that's what Satan tempted Eve to do. He didn't say eat the fruit. He said, did God really say, I mean, what kind of person is God? And she started to doubt God. Then other stuff happened. So sin is distrust, which leads to a couple of things. First of all, fear. God had been coming every day, meeting with Adam and Eve, no problem. After the, the encounter with the, with the talking serpent, they were afraid of him. He managed to paint this picture of God that made them scared of God. Fear. And fear leads to selfishness. When we are afraid, we think of ourselves first. If the room starts to burn, you're not thinking about, please, go ahead of me. Everybody's going to run for the door. This is what happens. Fear leads to self. We think of self first. And you see that happening in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Own existence as, uh, from, as departure from God. Right. 
I think the fear part is what start which starts that trajectory. Really? Yeah. You think that we are not uh, selfish by our self? I mean, even if there isn't a fire, we are still selfish, you know? Yes, we yes. Think only about indeed, ourselves. indeed, and uh, yeah, exactly. But I think that the root problem is our fear of or distrust of God. Yes, but I have another question then. Uh, is really the fear or uh, the distrust that is the sin, or is the sin that uh, we believe that we could be more than we are, that we could be like God? Yeah. And then the distrust came. And all but the thing is, why start to think that if you don't, first of all, distrust that God has said, I've made you in my image, etc. That This is what Satan's been doing. His, his way of operating is to sow distrust. Because if you distrust, then you have to start thinking, okay, I've got to look after my own self. I've got to take matters into my own hands. You mean he's hiding stuff from me and not wanting me to be the best I can be. He's trying to make me less than I should be. I should be like God. It all starts. It all starts with the distrust. That's what I, that's my, that's how I see it. Well, I have another question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it will be fast. Um, I understand that distrust is like the, the first thing. Yeah. But what I would say is that uh, the actual root is that uh, I, as the Lucifer also did. He first wanted to be more than he was. And then it was like, why doesn't God let me be more than I am? Uh, and then he wanted to become. But it's not a down. The what? Down means the point of being at the actual medical stage. Okay, yeah. Uh, w can we car carry on after school? I, I, I think you've got a, a yes. Um, because I've only got five minutes to finish up, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting discussion. I, I do think that what, what he started to do, because when he came, the first thing he says, did God really say that you, he's sowing seeds of distrust, that that's the first thing, always, because from that, if you've always been trusting in God and that's broken, it leads to everything else. It leads to the selfishness, self-preservation. It leads to fear and all the rest of it. So that's how I see it happening. But... In the Bible commentary, it even says that the basis of sin is relational. It's to do with how we're relating to God. That, that's, that's the foundation for sin. And that's important because what God's trying to do, God's solution for sin, is to move us from distrusting Him to trusting Him. That's why Jesus is saying, do you believe that in the Bible... The word for believe, faith, and trust is the same word. They're not different things. We have three different words in English. I don't know what you have in your languages. But it's just the same word. It's trust. So God's trying to move us from distrust back to trust. From fear to confidence in Him. From selfishness back to love. Thinking of others. So, um, so Jesus' healing ministry... Notice when, when, when he read the, 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 the scroll in, in, uh, in his hometown, it was to show the Lord's favor, to proclaim the Lord's favor. All the healing he did was to restore trust in God because people thought we are under God's curse. God is looking with disfavor on us. That's why we are overrun by the Romans. That was people's idea with regards to God. Jesus' healing ministry was to show, listen, God looks at you with favor. And that's what you were bringing out in your stories as well, actually. The grace of God. It's, he's, he's favorable towards us, not disfavorable. So, when it comes to the priestly pro prohibitions, I think what you've got to remember is, this is given at a time when they've just come out of slavery. Over 400 years of slavery where the way in which you are measured is how well you can work. Your agency. So if you can work hard, you are worth something. Yeah? 
Um, and that's the mindset God was dealing with. And so he, this is what I find fascinating here. For me, God meets people where they are. They measure worth by agency, so he does that in the way he describes the priests. Yeah, because he's got to meet them there. He can't be meeting them as if they're mature. He's got to meet them where they're at. So he meets them there, and that's why that you have that description. Remember where we are in the storyline. Just come out of slavery, not used to thinking for yourself, etc. And so he was willing to use their descriptions. But notice, later on in the Bible, God uses brokenness to describe what he's trying to do. Isaiah 53 is a perfect example, okay? Um, and I think maybe for us, so one big lesson is we should seek to imitate God's willingness to contextualize. Meet people where they are. This isn't so much about disability. This is about God reaching people where they are, speaking their language, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, yeah, you, you've done this quite well already. It meant uh, a lot of, a lot of um, sin and disability is the way people were thinking. If you notice, Jesus' healing ministry, again, is to re-emphasize God is for you. All the miracles he did. Um, same thing there. The man born blind, I think, is fascinating because uh, the work of God, remember he says, this has happened so that the work of God might be manifested in him. The work of God was not his healing. Jesus says in John 6, the work of God is this, to believe, to trust in God again. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to restore relationship. That's the work of God. Um, so it wasn't so much about the healing, it's about revealing the man's faith, and he really did end up trusting God. Um, so then, yes, I'll go past that. I'd like to say, for us as Adventists, we have a challenge, and this is stuff that I did in my dissertation. Our health message makes us look at people as healthy or unhealthy. When you see my son in a wheelchair, often people take for granted he's unhealthy because he's got a disability. We've got to rethink our health message so that we're not looking at people like that. Yeah? Um, and our churches can be healing places. So let's redefine, this is my last slide, this I believe is true health. This Theologian Jürgen Moltmann says, true health is the strength to live, the strength to suffer, the strength to die. Health is not a condition of my body. It is the power of my soul to cope with the varying conditions of that body. My son doesn't know what it's like to be pain-free. He has pain constantly. He lives with that. I'd say he's much healthier than I am because he has a strength of soul to cope with that every single day of his life. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Patrick. That was amazing. You know, um, I had the pleasure having you as my pastor for seven years in England, and um, I was blessed back then, and I hope everybody was blessed today as well by this presentation. Thank you so much again. And to our online viewers, I, first I want to apologize that we had some technical difficulties at the beginning, but we are working on those, and hopefully for the next session it will be better. So uh, stay tuned, stay on our channel. You will see there is constant uh, content. We try to provide as much as possible for you so that you at home can also be part of this amazing Youth Congress here. Thank you very much and see you at the next stream. Okay, enjoy your lunch, everyone. Thank you so much. Did you do the um, filler?